good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone, depending on where you are in the world. I appreciate you joining us today and look forward to introducing you to one of the newest members of the Gibco stem cell family, Essential Aid Flex Medium, which has been designed to eliminate the need for daily feeding in human pluripotent stem cell cultures. In order to get everybody in the right frame of mind, I wanted to start with a brief overview of how human pluripotent stem cell culture has evolved over the last 15 to 20 years. Starting in 1998, the first publication detailing an optimized human PSC culture system came out of Jamie Thompson's lab at the University of Wisconsin. Now, for better or for worse, this system did rely on FBS supplementation as well as a supportive feeder layer of mouse fibroblasts. Uh, certainly a groundbreaking step in that it laid a foundation for everything that's happened since in the human PSC culture space. But due to the inc inclusion of FBS and a feeder layer, there really were and have been some challenges in transferring to new labs, as well as in run-to-run -run consistency. Two years later, a new report introduced a switch from FBS supplementation to Gibco's knockout serum replacer while maintaining the use of a supportive feeder layer. This certainly represented a step in the right direction towards a more defined system, though it did still suffer from a reliance on both murine feeder cells as well as a supplement that contained animal origin constituents. Just one year later, the next step involved a transition away from feeder-supported cultures to feeder-conditioned medium. And this further simplified the workflow but the fact that it still relied on a reagent, namely feeder conditioned medium, with limited long-term reproducibility, uh, this left further room for improvement. Fast forward a few more years, and we come to the period between 2005 and 2007, which was actually a very busy time in this space. And during this period, we see the launch of the first chemically defined human PSC culture media. And that list includes Gibco StemPro ESCSFM, as well as m 1 Now, because these are defined formulations, they end up being uh, more consistent lot to lot, not to mention the fact that they're a bit easier to work with uh, than some of the, 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 the predecessors. All those benefits aside, however, we're still dealing with undefined components, specifically bovine serum albumin, which end up exhibiting lot to lot variability and may require screening of lots to find the one that works best for your purposes. We fast forward a few more years, it takes us to 2011, the year that was highlighted by the launch of Gibco's Essential 8 media system. Um, this is another chemically defined medium, but in this case we're talking about one that's xeno free, so includes um, no animal origin components. This elimination of animal-derived components eliminates some of the inconsistency that's been observed in the predecessors to Essential 8 and has actually proved quite simple to use. Just in case you may not be familiar, I did want to briefly introduce the Essential 8 medium and some of the benefits it provides. Unlike many of the media I introduced earlier, Essential 8 was specifically formulated for the culture of human PSCs rather than tweaked to work with the cell type. As the name indicates, Essential 8 includes only the components required for PSC culture and nothing more. This eliminates some of the concerns about lot-to-lot -lot consistency that plague many of the other commercially available PSC culture media, and also virtually eliminates the complex component-component interactions that can occur in complex media formulations and may introduce additional variables to your stem cell cultures. As is the case with many of the other Gibco products, Essential 8 comes under CGMP quality standards, providing yet another level of comfort that each new bottle is going to be as good as the last. And finally, we offer a defined substrate, namely truncated recombinant human vitronectin, the catalog number of which is listed there on the slide, that when paired with Essential 8 medium presents a consistent economical, and scalable defined culture system. Now, all that being said, I think a lot of the audience out there will agree with me when I say that standard stem cell culture can still be painful. For me in particular, those last two days in the schedule that I'm showing you here are the most painful. If you want to keep your cultures as happy and as healthy as possible, you're really going to want to be coming into the lab and feeding them on a daily basis. 
Now, it turns out the need for this daily feeding is actually driven by the heat sensitivity of a few key factors present in many stem cell formulations. These have been shown to lose activity with prolonged exposure to the 37C temperatures used to culture human stem cells. Without these key components, FGF2 being a good example, you'll fairly quickly lose pluripotency of your cultures, as demonstrated on the image, by the image on your screen now. You see a few small islands of tightly packed stem cell colonies, but the culture is quickly overwhelmed by spontaneously differentiated cells. Routine PSC culture does introduce some additional challenges, including both the frequently, frequent handling of cells as well as multiple users handling a single culture, often throughout the life of key experiments. Both of these have the potential to introduce additional variability to your results, not to mention the fact that they may open up new routes to contamination. With these challenges in mind, the Essential 8 Flex team set out to develop a new product whose goal is to enable you to take back control of your PSC culture schedule. Speaking personally, I often find that my life needs to get arranged around when I need to be in the lab tending to my cells. And with Essential 8 Flex Medium, we're hoping that we can reverse that trend. We want you to be able to fit your PSC culture schedule into your lives rather than the other way around. Now, what exactly is Essential 8 Flex Medium? Well, the formulation has been based upon the very successful Essential 8 Medium, which means that you're getting a chemically defined, xeno-free, feeder-free medium along with Gibco CGMP quality. The added benefit that Essential 8 Flex brings to the table is the fact that the formulation has been optimized to preserve the signaling activity of some of those key pluripotency enabling molecules. You'll see through the rest of the talk that I'll actually use FGF2 as a good example indicator of that. In stabilizing the activity of these key molecules, we enable not only weekend-free culture, but also generally more stable culture conditions. In addition to giving you time back, you'll see a reduction in the media volumes you're using, all without negatively impacting the quality of your PSCs over the course of long-term culture. Here I'd like to introduce our optimized culture schedule, which has been developed to eliminate weekend feeding and has the added benefit of a feed-free day during the week. Unlike some of the other protocols that have been demonstrated to support weekend-free culture in the short term, the Essential 8 Flex system does not rely on a single very low density split on Friday to get your cells through the weekend. With the optimized feed split schedule you see here, you'll maintain fairly high densities throughout the life of your culture and won't find yourself waiting for cells to get confluent enough to split again. With this example schedule, we advise a split on Monday and on Thursday with a feed about 24 hours after that split. This should be compatible with folks using rock in inhibition during cell plating, although rock inhibition certainly isn't required for successful culture. I also should say, even if you aren't using rock inhibitors, we still suggest that you feed the day after splitting, simply to ensure that you remove any of the debris that may have resulted from your passaging the prior day, and to prevent cells from sitting in that debris during your feed-free days. I think it's also important to call out the fact that this protocol does have the potential to be tweaked to fit your particular scheduling needs. Um, one thing I think it's important to also note, however, is that it's uh, critical that your cells go no more than three days per week without feeding, as indicated here, and only two of those days can be consecutive. As I mentioned earlier, Essential 8 Flex was really built upon the Essential 8 Foundation, and as a result, pretty much anything that you are doing with Essential 8 today, you should be able to continue to do with Essential 8 Flex. If we're talking about matrices, our general suggestion would still be the, recomb the recombinant vitronectin, although you'll also see nice comp compatibility with gel tricks. In terms of dissociation reagents, the sky is really the limit. Our general suggestion will continue to be EDTA or versine-mediated clump passaging, but if you're using something like Accutase, Dysbase, or Trypsin, those enzyme-mediated dissociation methods work quite well. One thing that I do want to draw some attention to is the potential to pair our triple select dissociation reagent with our recently developed Revitacel supplement for single cell passaging. 
I've actually fallen in love with this method over the course of, uh, of a few other projects because of how well it helps me maintain consistent cell densities. And that consistency ultimately gives me my best performing cultures. It's important to draw attention to the fact that when you're doing single cell passaging, particularly on vitronectin, you want to make sure that you're using a Revita cell, which has been developed specifically with human PSCs in mind, or if not Revita cell, another ROC inhibitor to limit cell death upon plating. Um, and finally, last but certainly not least, we come to cell banking. Uh, in brief, we've had really nice success with cryopreservation with Essential 8 Flex. Um, we've been able to both freeze, cell down, freeze cells down as well as revive them using our new, the new media system. All right, so now we've hopefully got a decent foundation as to what exactly Essential 8 Flex is and what it does. Uh, and now that we're there, I want to take a little bit of time to let you behind the curtain a bit and provide some visibility into our development process. I'll start by outlining some of the methods we, we've used to better understand how the system is performing on a basic level. And in the second part of the rest of the talk, I'll discuss where we've put the lion's share of the work into validating the performance of Essential 8 Flex, namely in long-term PSC culture studies. First, I'd like to get you in the right mindset for some of the media development efforts that we ultimately went through. As I've mentioned a few different times, we went into this program knowing that certain key molecules were losing activity when exposed to the elevated temperatures required for cell culture. In the development process, we were able to set up a pretty nice system where we would supplement various formulation candidates with FGF2, incubate for a period of time, uh, again at 37C, and then use one of uh, the assays that's shown here to measure the drop in activity. One, which is indicated in red there, was a cell-based assay, a HEC 293 uh, FRET reporter line that would respond specifically to FGF2 stimulation. The other, pictured in blue, was an ELISA. Uh, it's an ELISA you can actually find on thermofisher.com via the SKU I've listed there below. And it does a really nice job of not just quantifying FGF2, but actually quantifying bioactive FGF2. And you can see how well the results there correlate with the cell-based assay. So if you look at this plot on the whole, what you're actually looking at as you move from left to right is our development process as it evolved. Um, and you can see in attempts one, two, and three, we actually weren't all that successful um, with these formulations uh, exhibited by the fact that FGF exhibited significant losses in activity after incubation at 37C. However, as we move from left to right and get to some of those later formulations, one of which ultimately became the Essential 8 Flex Media, we see really nice responses in FGF2, even after that prolonged exposure at 37C. So once we'd identified a nice formulation that optimized the activity of FGF2 and some of the other key molecules that are present in these culture media, we wanted to get a sense for how it might be performing with respect to other commercially available PSC culture media. What you're looking at here are some of the results of that experiment, where we've taken three commercially available PSC culture media supplemented each according to the manufacturer's suggestion, and then incubated them at 37C for a period between 1 and 72 hours. The results we see here are actually quite striking. Even knowing that FGF2 is going to experience activity loss at elevated temperatures, I have to admit I was really surprised to see just how quickly that happens. Depending on your media system of choice, we ended up seeing upwards of 50% activity losses after as little as 4 to 8 hours at 37C, with a measurable decrease in as little as 1 to 2 hours after uh, exposure to those elevated temperatures. Another frankly disconcerting way to look at this is that in the period between your breakfast and your lunch, about half of the FGF2 activity in your standard PSC culture media is gone. Lunch to dinner, you've lost another half. Um, again, it's a, it's a fairly striking result, particularly in light of the fact that even when we're being as diligent as we think we need to be in changing the media on a daily basis, we're still seeing FGF2 levels as low as 5 to 10% of where we started by the time um, 24 hours is up and you're getting back in the lab to feed your cells. And just as a reminder for one of my earlier slides, culturing cells in the absence of active FGF2 is going to fairly quickly lead to spontaneous differentiation that we just really hate, hate, hate to see in our cultures. Now, 
Now, when I add the Essential 8 Flex data to this picture, it changes things substantially. Where the competitor media were seeing significant losses as early as one, two, four, maybe eight hours in culture, in Essential 8 Flex, the FGF bioactivity is upwards of 90 to 95% of where it started, even after these prolonged periods. If we look at this from the half-life perspective again, rather than being in the four to eight hour range, which is where the competitors fell, the half-life of FGF2 signaling activity in Essential 8 Flex is on the order of 300 hours. That's a pretty substantial increase from four to eight. Um, and one thing to keep in mind here is that 300 hours is far, far beyond what we would ever allow or suggest that anybody else allows their PSC cultures to go without feeding. Um, and as another reminder, and just to end the, the story on kind of a happy note, remember that robust FGF2 activity gives you happy, healthy cell culture. Now that we've seen this result, what we wanted to look at was to see just how far we could push our system. In order, in order to do some extreme stress testing, we took some of those early formulation attempts that I showed you on, a, on one of the earlier slides, supplemented them with FGF2, and incubated at 37C for a period of 48 hours. Now this pre-stressed media that was at 37C for two days was then used to culture PSCs for up to three passages using the aforementioned weekend-free culture schedule. What we see, and you can see the images here, fairly quickly is, is significant spontaneous differentiation in cultures, like in Formulation 1, where the media fails to preserve FGF2 activity. However, in the case of Essential 8 Flex, we have pretty nice looking cultures. I do want to point out here that uh, in these extreme stress scenarios, by the time we're through our weekend free, uh, sorry, our, our feed free weekend period, the media has been at 37C for upwards of five days. Again, that's far beyond what we would ever suggest or expose our routine cultures to, but uh, even despite that extreme stress, the system is holding up quite well. And here, if we look at the same experiment qu quantitatively, we actually see that TRA-160 expression, which ends up being a pretty good uh, pluripotency marker indicator that's expressed on the surface of human PSCs, is maintained quite well in these uh, extreme stress test essential aid flex weekend free cultures. If we look at uh, those cultures in blue compared to what we see in formulation one in red, um, it's really night and day. Formulation one, virtually all of the TRA-160 expression has been lost during culture. And now one last point I wanted to hit on before getting um, a little more in-depth into the PSC culture work. Uh, when I first got a look at the results of that 72-hour stress test, it really made me think a little bit more about how we're inter interacting with our standard cultures on a day-to-day -day basis. In the best case, when we're feeding every 24 hours, your cultures are still experiencing a pretty rapid and cyclical drop in FGF activity. Uh, that's followed by a sharp spike when you change the media. You can see that in the red curve uh, I've modeled there. This repeats on a daily basis over the course of the lifetime of your culture, so it's constantly happening. Uh, the case is very different when it comes to essential aid flex cultures. The blue line there is a model of, of what uh, FGF2 activity levels in your essential aid flex medium cultures look like um, throughout the course of a week. Uh, first thing you should notice is that the weekend, uh, sorry, the window in which FGF2 activity fluctuates is actually quite a bit smaller than what we see in, in competitor M. Um, you're looking at really only 5 to 10 percent level changes in, uh, in signaling activity levels throughout the course of the week. Now if we change the perspective a bit and we look at uh, that same competitor M media, but this time using the uh, the suggested weekend free protocol, where you have a split on Friday at low density to get you through the weekend, um, you see again the consistent and routine drop and spike throughout the week when you have your daily feeding portion. But when it comes to the weekend, there's an even more dramatic and extended period of culture with very low levels of FGF2 activity. So again, low levels of FGF2 give you uh, unhealthy cultures, um, and you really want to be aware of what's happening in your, in your media over the long term. 
And with that, hopefully I've given you some insight into what we were thinking as we developed this product, as well as, at least at first, how we understood its performance. From here on, I'm going to be focused on long-term PSC culture work, which is pretty obviously the most important way that we can demonstrate the effectiveness of the Essential 8 Flex media system. In order to evaluate that for performance, we did want to make sure that we use the same types of tools that you out there are using uh, to evaluate your cultures today. So I won't get into the details of any one particular aspect right now, but I will uh, give you some insight into performance in each of these aspects in the coming slides. So I wanted to start with morphology. Um, and I start here because personally, I use the way that my cells look as really a first line of defense and as an indicator of how they're doing. And what you're looking at here on the left are H9 embryonic stem cells cultured in standard essential 8 medium for 10 passages. Um, with these, you see the expected PSC morphology, you know, tightly packed colonies, defined borders, a high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio, a nice looking culture there on the left. On the right, what you see is a parallel culture. Again, they're H9 ESCs, uh, but these have been maintained in essential 8 flex medium with weekend free feeding. A uh, major take-home here is that morphology is essentially equivalent. Uh, in my mind, using at least my eyes, it's nearly impossible to tell these two cultures apart and that remain consistent over the course of the, the lifetime of these cultures. Um, throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to use similar comparisons to show how Essential 8 Flex is performing with respect to Essential 8. Uh, and in every case, when I talk about Essential 8, these cultures have been maintained using the standard daily feeding method whereas flex cultures will have been maintained with the optimized weekend free schedule I introduced in one of the first few slides. Now, having seen that the cells were showing good morphology, we wanted to get a sense for what their growth rates looked like. Um, when it comes to my experience in cell culture, be it in PSCs or any other cell type, one way I know to get my cells to grow faster, just to give them a little bit of a kickstart, would be to feed them every day. Now, knowing that standard PSC workflow requires this daily feed, we wanted to get an understanding of how limiting the number of feeds would affect the growth rates over time. So what you're looking at here is an example of an experiment in which two cell lines, one embryonic on the left and one induced pluripotent line on the right, were plated at low density, uh, in this case on a Thursday, it's time zero, fed on Friday morning according to that optimized protocol, and then monitored um, in real time uh, for confluence using an in-incubator microscope system. In the blue curves, you see our essential eight cultures, which are, of course, fed every day, as indicated by those regular blue arrows. In the red, you've got your essential eight flex cultures, which were fed, as I said, on Friday morning, according to that um, optimized protocol, as well as on Monday morning, indicated by that second later red arrow. And looking at these plots, you see that there are only slight, if any, differences in the growth rate of these cells in Essential 8 versus Essential 8 Flex. Um, what we also have seen, and actually you can see kind of a little bit of it here, is that there may be some cell line dependency on how the cells respond to eliminating that daily feed using Essential 8 Flex. Um, so in any case, I would certainly encourage you to test this out in your particular lines. We know that everybody's uh, IPSC lines may behave a little bit differently, so you may want to look at this. Um, in your particular lines to confirm. That being said, even when we do see differences, like we do in the H9 cells, the essential 8 flex cultures really end up being only a few hours behind their paired essential 8 cultures. Uh, and there's a very simple fix to this. What I found is if you seed your cells at a slightly higher density at the time of plating in essential 8 flex, they really do keep up with essential 8. So just for an example, um, if you're using the H9 line and say you're splitting at a 1 to 8 regularly, uh, you may want to try a 1 to 7 or a 1 to 6 ratio in Essential 8 Flex. And that's something that's really ended up working quite well in our hands. Okay, now that we've had an understanding that these cells are looking good and growing well, the next step was to assess how well they were expressing the expected pluripotency markers. As a first pass, we took the molecular probes pluripotent stem cell four marker immunocytochemistry kit and monitored the expression of four markers over long-term culture. Uh, in this case, you're looking at passage 25 cultures. Uh, I believe these are H9s. 
Um, but I should say the results are consistent all the way up through 50, uh, 50 passages. Uh, this kit includes two surface markers, TRA-160, which you see in the lower left panels, and SSEA-4, which you see in the upper right, as well as two nuclear stains, namely OCT-4 that's in the upper right panel, as well as SOX-2 that's stained alongside TRA-160 in the lower left. And really across the board what we see here is that the expression of these markers in both Essential 8 and Essential 8 Flex is extremely robust. We see the expected patterns in both cultures, and again, truthfully, you'd be hard-pressed to tell me you could identify which one is essential eight and which one is flex when you're looking at these side by side. Uh, one thing I did want to add to this panel is NANOG expression. So NANOG is not included in the aforementioned ICC kit, but we do know that it's a very sensitive um, indicator of losses in pluripotency, in some cases dropping off before any of the other standard indicators, so we thought it was good to look at NANOG expression in these particular cultures. And again, uh, I'm starting to probably sound like a broken record here, but the results between Essential 8 and Essential 8 Flex are virtually identical with very robust NANOG expression expressed throughout the life of the cultures, again, all the way up through passage 50. So having seen all this, um, you know that ICC is a nice indicator of what's going on in your culture, although really it's only representative of a very small fraction of the larger population of cells. So in order for us to get a broader, more qualitative, sorry, quantitative measure of pluripotency marker expression, we wanted to look at TRA-160 expression via flow cytometry. Uh, what you're looking at here is honestly my favorite data set of everything we've generated throughout the development process in that not only does it encompass the very long period of time that we've spent in validating the performance of the system, uh, but it's also a beautiful result. Uh, in this case, what we're looking at are Gibco episomal iPSCs that have been cultured on recombinant human vitronectin using the standard versine-mediated clump passaging method. Now, throughout the life of this culture, we've monitored TRA-160 expression, and what you see here are histograms indicating that ex those expression levels at some key time points throughout the life of the cultures. Um, and in my mind, it's pretty striking how well these two data sets align. Uh, so if you're looking at the Essential 8 with daily feeding in blue, or the Essential 8 Flex weekend free cultures in red, they're almost perfectly overlaid, indicating not only good performance, we're seeing very robust TRA-160 expression throughout the life of the cultures, but also uh, virtually equivalent performance across these systems over long term. Now, moving forward and really continuing to get a better sense of the performance of our new culture medium, we wanted to look at tri-lineage differentiation potential. We know that maintaining cultures with robust pluripotency marker expression is critical to the work. Obviously, you want the cells to be expressing those markers, but it's by no means the end, and really it's just the beginning. Uh, we know you guys are growing these cells largely so you can use them as a tool to generate the cells that you actually want to study. As a result, as a supplement to the pluripotency marker expression, we wanted to demonstrate that essential eight flex cultures had the capacity to differentiate into cells of each of the three lineages. Um, and here what you see is a synopsis of a tri-lineage study that we actually repeated a number of times throughout the, uh, the course of our long-term cultures. Uh, essential eight and essential eight flex cultures were first allowed to form embryoid bodies, and then after four days, we plated those embryoid bodies on gel checks coated plates. Following that plating, we used a knockout serum replacement supplemented medium um, to allow these EBs to mature over the course of three weeks on those gel checks coated surfaces. Uh, after three weeks, the cultures were fixed, permeabilized, and stained using the molecular probes three germ layer ICC kit that I've shown here. Um, this kit uses beta-3 tubulin, smooth muscle actin, and alpha feta protein to demonstrate ability to become cells of the ectodermal, mesodermal, and endodermal lineages, respectively. And you see here uh, examples of our essential aid flex cultures with uh, really nice tri-lineage potential. One question that I always get, though, is, okay, well, how do the EA cultures look in comparison? So here what I've showed you are side by side how tri-lineage lineage potential of essential eight on the top compares to that of essential eight flex cultures again on the bottom. 
Um, again, broken record here, but we see virtually no difference in the ability for these two culture systems to generate robust trilineage differentiation. Now, much like ICC was a, a nice introduction to pluripotency marker expression, we viewed those last spontaneous differentiation uh, from EB studies as an introduction to prilineage potential. It shows us that these cells are capable of forming each of the three lineages, but doesn't really tell us about how well they're able to do so. So in order to answer that question, we turn to some of the newer members of the GIBCO PSC family, namely our direct, directed differentiation kits. And so as we move from top to bottom, what we've done is taken cells, uh, PSCs, that were at least 10, at least 10 passages in essential eight flex, uh, using again that weekend free method, and then induce them to first definitive endoderm cells using the kit listed at the top. Uh, I know the flow cytometry histogram is a little small, but what we see there is really nice, robust expression of CXCR4, uh, really greater than 90 to 95% of all the cells that were included in that culture. So for those of you interested in uh, pancreatic or other gut lineage cells, I'd strongly encourage you to look into this kit. Um, it's incredibly easy to use. You get, as I said, 95 plus percent CXCR4 expressing cultures within, say, two days. Um, it's actually quite amazing. I'm moving to the middle panel, and I know I shouldn't be playing favorites, but this actually is my favorite of the three, and I think I'll show you why on the next slide. Um, you see the results from the GIBCO PSC cardiomyocyte differentiation kit. This one allows you to take robust pluripotent cultures, um, in this case we've used obviously essential eight flex cultures, and turn them into spontaneously beating cardiomyocytes. It's really fascinating stuff. Uh, like I said, I'm going to show you a video on the next slide. Uh, but in the histogram here, you can see consistent expression of TNNT2, which is a good indicator of uh, really nice cardiomyocyte differentiation. And now finally, last but not least, is the elder statesman of our directed differentiation product line, the GIBCO PSC Neural Induction Medium. Now this particular kit allows you to take PSC cultures and gives you beautiful neural stem cell cultures that you can then take to specific neural lineages. Uh, much like the other kits that I mentioned, it's pretty rapid. Uh, and you can see from the histograms here, you end up with you know, upwards of 90% SOX1 expressing NSCs that, again, are going to be amenable to your downstream further differentiation. Now, moving on, uh, I really can never resist showing these cardiomyocyte videos when given the opportunity. Uh, and I think you'll see why in a few moments. What you'll be looking at is on the left, a cardiomyocyte culture which was generated from passage 10 H9 cells that were cultured in uh, essential eight medium. On the right, you'll see a parallel passage, again 10, uh, 10 passages in essential eight flex medium. These cells were plated on vitronectin coated surfaces and induced via the kit, the last, uh, sorry, the middle kit I showed in the last slide. And the videos you're about to see were taken 11 days after differentiation was initiated. And what you'll notice are some really nice networks of cardiomyocytes that are beating in unison with, again, nothing really to distinguish an essential eight flex culture from an essential eight culture. Now, as we begin to round out the last data sets I'll be presenting today, we come to the assessment of genetic stability in these cultures. And we get this question a lot, and actually when I came to presenting this idea internally for the first time, uh, there were a lot of questions about whether or not we would see stable karyotypes in these cultures. Uh, as a result, we were sure to monitor them regularly in real time. And so what you're looking at here are multiple cell lines, again, the H9 ESC and GIBCO episomal IPSCs, uh, taken all the way out to 50 passages with, across the board, no indications of genetic instability in any of the cultures whatsoever. Um, obviously, for those of you with an eye towards cell therapy and regenerative medicine, uh, you can't really afford to have any genetic abnormalities pop up, so this was a really nice result to see. And now with this, I'm going to close the data portion of the talk. 
um, and present. Actually, this is the, the newest batch of data we've generated using uh, the Essential Aid Flex Medium system. This one shows compatibility with uh, with reprogramming using our Cytotune 2.0 Sendai reprogramming kit. I just summarize this very briefly. Uh, neonatal dermal fibroblasts were reprogrammed via Cytotune and then cultured in either Essential 8 with daily feeding or Essential 8 flex medium with weekend free feeding for a period of 21 days. Uh, any IPSC colonies that resulted were then stained with alkaline phosphatase substrate and were enumerated in, in order to calculate a reprogramming efficiency, um, the summary of which is shown in the upper left panel. And as you can see from this plot, whether you're interested in reprogramming using vitronectin or Geltrex as a substrate, you really should see nice compatibility with weekend free reprogramming using Cytotune and paired with the Essential 8 Flex system. Um, at the risk of again mentioning myself as a broken record, there's virtually no difference between uh, the performance in Essential 8 with that that we see in Essential 8 Flex. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. Uh, hopefully you've learned a little bit about how our new Essential 8 Flex medium performs. Uh, hopefully you're excited about taking back control of your PSC culture schedule. And just as a reminder, you're still getting all of the feeder-free, xeno-free benefits of Essential 8 with the added benefit of the preservation uh, of bioactivity of those key constituents. In the process of eliminating feeds as we've done with Essential 8 Flex, you're going to end up spending less time in the hood, consuming less media, and ultimately reducing the cost of maintaining your cultures. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, probably most importantly, you're not going to be seeing any adverse effect on the health or quality of your cultures. I also want to make sure that I take a moment to give credit to the folks that made all this work possible. Uh, and in that regard, two names in particular come to mind, Jeff Fine and Majida Muhammad. Uh, these two really did generate the majority of the data that I presented today. I'd say they did a spectacular job, and I would not be able to be here today speaking to you without their critical input. Um, similar kudos go out to the extended R&D team, as well as to the greater product development team, uh, both of which are listed here. Uh, rest assured, these types of programs do not just happen on their own. It really does take a village, and I want to make sure I say a big thanks to everybody that made this possible. With that, I'll close. Just remind you that if you're interested in learning more about Essential 8 Flex and maybe trying, uh, trying it out in your PSC culture, please head over to thermofisher.com and search for Essential 8 Flex. Good luck, and take care. <laughs>